Hi, I'm Chris Fanta. I'm a member of the Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine Division at Brigham and Women's Hospital, director of our Partners Asthma Center, and a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. And I'm pleased to have the opportunity to review with you these board-like questions uh, in pulmonary medicine. And I have no financial conflicts to disclose. So let's just get into it with our first question. Is a 75-year-old smoker a pack a day for 40 years, quitting 15 years ago, ago, who presents with progressive exertional dyspnea over the last six months? He reports a non-productive cough, worse in the mornings, no fever, no chest pain or hemoptysis, and no orthopnea, PND, or swelling of his lower extremities, nothing to make you think about heart failure. He's retired from his work as a lawyer, he has no unusual exposures at home, no complaint of arthritis, no symptoms of Raynaud's disease. And I'm glad you asked these questions about it. His exam is notable for clubbing of the digits and coarse inspiratory crackles in the lower lung zones bilaterally. His oxygen saturation sitting quietly was 95%, but when you got up and went for a walk with him just down the corridor, it quickly fell to 87% and your oximeter alarm started ringing. Sent him for pulmonary function tests, spirometry revealed moderate restriction. If you had done full lung volumes, the total lung capacity would confirm moderate restriction and a reduced diffusion capacity. Chest X-ray shows increased linear markings, predominantly in the lower lung zones. His chest CT scan shows basilar honeycomb and traction bronchiectasis. Chest X-ray and CAT scan. Can you make out the honeycombing in the peripheral uh, distribution here, particularly along the uh, diaphragm and laterally? All right, so what's next? What would you do? Send him uh, to pulmonary medicine to get a transbronchial lung biopsy, refer to thoracic surgery for thoracoscopic lung biopsy, begin anti-inflammatory therapy for an interstitial lung disease with high-dose prednisone, begin immunosuppressive therapy with prednisone and azathioprine, or begin antifibrotic therapy with perfenidone or nintedinib. And it's interesting because this is a little bit of the evolution of pulmonary medicine over the last 10 years. The correct answer now is I think it would be appropriate to uh, discuss and begin an antifibrotic therapy with him for what is presumably idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. The history is typical, the examination, the physiology, typical, and the CAT scan sufficiently uh, typical that no additional biopsy information is needed. That's a change, isn't it? Years ago, I think one would have said, especially in a younger person, interstitial disease of this sort, let's get a, a lung biopsy. It would be a thoracoscopic lung biopsy to have lung tissue and make a specific etiologic diagnosis. Now the understanding is that when the chest imaging is sufficiently classic, you're not going to find anything else other than usual interstitial pneumonitis on lung biopsy and therefore make a diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So based on the history, classic presentation uh, of uh, lung biopsy is not needed. And now, having made a diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, what are we going to do? Years ago, we would have begun high-dose uh, prednisone and maybe add a second immunosuppressive drug such as azathioprine until the randomized clinical trial compared prednisone and azathioprine uh, for uh, treatment of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis with placebo. And in this randomized trial, found a worsened outcome in the group assigned to prednisone and azathioprine. So we were harming people with anti-inflammatory therapy and had little to offer in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis until 
the development of the novel antifibrotic therapies, perfenidone and nitentinib, which would now be appropriate. They do not make the disease better. They prevent the accelerated decline that happens over time, meant to slow the decline in lung function, the progressive scarring that occurs over time. Here's a quickie. Conditions commonly associated with cystic fibrosis include all of the following except. So which one would not be seen in uh, cystic fibrosis? A is bronchiectasis, B is sinusitis, C is airflow obstruction, D is aspermia, and E is systemic pseudomonas infections. Systemic pseudomonas infections. So the answer is E, uh, because yes, we see pseudomonas respiratory tract infection very commonly, but it is interesting, isn't it, despite the chronic presence of uh, airway infection with pseudomonas, pseudomonas bacteremia in cystic fibrosis would be very unusual. Systemic spread uh, is not uh, typically found, whereas the others are just typical features of, uh, of cystic fibrosis, the pulmonary manifestation, bronchiectasis, upper airway sinusitis, airflow obstruction, and due to uh, impaired vas deferens formation, aspermia in men are inferred. Okay, this is a question about asbestos-related lung disease. Again, uh, what would be the exception? What does not fit as a typical manifestation of asbestos-related intrathoracic disease? A, fibrocalcific parenchymal disease, predominantly involving the upper lung zones. B, pleural plaques. C, malignant mesothelioma. D, benign pleural effusions. E, bronchogenic carcinoma. Which one doesn't fit with asbestos-related lung disease? And answer is A. It's fancy terminology, fibrocalcific parenchymal disease. In the upper lung zones, you might well apply to old tuberculosis. We'll look at an example, but that's not the pattern of asbestosis, which is an interstitial disease typically involving the lung bases predominantly. Pleural plaques, of course, related to uh, uh, asbestos exposure, including calcified pleural plaques, malignant mesothelioma, yes. Benign pleural effusions you may not have encountered. It is a, a, one of the least common uh, associations, but uh, they are attributable to asbestos exposure, uh, can be unilateral or bilateral and sometimes bloody. And of course, lung cancer associated with asbestos exposure. So not this is not the appearance of asbestos-related lung disease. This would be old TB, wouldn't it? Calcification, fibrotic disease in the upper lung zones, retraction of the hilus, cephalad, uh, due to old scarring from old TB, not asbestos. Here, on the other hand, is a, an example of asbestos pleural plaques. And I show you it. Um, because in some way it looks rather nodular, doesn't it? Like they may be uh, uh, lung cancer or pulmonary nodules. But in fact, these are pleural plaques. Uh, if they're uh, lateral, they look like they're clearly related to the pleura. If they're anterior or posterior, uh, they um, are seen on FOS and therefore look rounded like a parenchymal nodule, but they're part of the pleura either the anterior or posterior pleural bone. Uh, here here uh, on CAT scanning, we'll see these dramatic example of pleural plaques here, not calcified. These are benign. They don't progress to mesothelioma. They're just a marker of asbestos exposure. This is an asbestosis. Asbestosis is interstitial lung disease associated with asbestos exposure. These are asbestos-related pleural plaques, a marker that this patient had asbestos exposure. And here, patient might present with shortness of breath, pleural pain, pleural effusion, and really even more than that, 
this sort of lobulated mass uh, expanding out from the uh, uh, chest wall. This is a malignant mesothelioma uh, presenting as pleural effusion and pleural mass. Next question. During the uh, December of last year, a 63-year-old man, a big cigarette smoker, noticed an increased amount of his usual cough and sputum production. His sputum turned yellow-green. Physical exam, not much to hear on chest exam. He had low-grade fever, chest x-ray, normal. Pretty routine history. For some reason, we sent a sputum. I'm not sure that we always would, but if we did, here comes the result. And the gram, gram stain came back before the culture results describing what looks like a good sample, less than 10 squamous epithelial cells for low powered field and many neutrophils. Uh, the predominant organism uh, is gram negative cocci in pairs. I guess we're asking what to make of that. Uh, the patient uh, is symptomatic, fever, increased cough and sputum. What will we treat with? Would it be ampicillin, amoxicillin, clavulanic acid, procaine penicillin IM, cefoxetine IV, cephalexin PO? And I think we're asked to think what might the organism be, and we'd like to make a case that this is most likely moraxella uh, and that the appropriate treatment for what is almost always uh, amoxicillin resistant or uh, beta lactamase positive and therefore amoxicillin resistant organism would be amoxicillin clavulanic acid. I, I, uh, cefoxetine would probably work but IV therapy isn't necessary and the others are less appropriate and it was just a reminder that gram-positive cocci uh, may be more than just oral flora. Uh, uh, and, and here, the, uh, excuse me, the gram-negative cocci, forgive me, the gram-negative cocci. We used to refer to these as um, Neisseria uh, and then Branamella, and I think the current terminology would be Moraxella cateralis, and this isn't just a, uh, common oral flora in the uh, oral pharynx. This is a passage in this gram-negative coccus, moraxella cateralis, and they almost always are beta-lactamase positive, so we want to choose not ampicillin, but something that might cover beta-lactamase positive organisms, such as our amoxicillin clavulanate. Let's think about pulmonary rehab and intensive uh, outpatient pulmonary rehabilitation program for a patient with chronic obstructive lung disease. What's the benefit? The proven benefit is A, is it improved survival? B, is it cardio improved cardiovascular function? C, is it improved exercise tolerance? Or D, uh, improved expiratory flow rates, lung function? eight weeks to 12 weeks, two to three times per week, um, treadmill, bicycle, upper body exercise for patients with uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and dyspnea. And the outcome that we can suggest is that at the end of this uh, training program, you will be able to do more. You'll be able to walk further. You'll feel better. You'll be more confident in your improved exercise tolerance. In order to sustain this, of course, you'll have to continue the exercise. Otherwise, if you stop exercising, the benefit wanes quickly. There is not evidence to show improved survival. Um, there's probably not intense enough level of um, uh, cardiac stimulation during exercise to uh, achieve improved cardiovascular function. And the disappointment for most of my patients is Will my lung function get better if I do this? And the, you know, will my breathing test results improve? And the answer is no, right? That the, the FEV1, the expiratory flow, is determined by lung elastic recoil and airway diameter. It's not determined primarily by your muscle strength and building muscles with exercise 
won't improve your lung function. Exercise tolerance improves due to improve muscle fitness and the like, uh, uh, oxygen extraction from muscles, etc., but not uh, improved lung function. Here's a clinical case, a 67-year-old woman with persistent productive cough, occasional blood streaking of her sputum. It's been more than a year now. She has mild exertional dyspnea, reports six to seven pounds weight loss, no fever or chest pain, lifelong non-smoker, she had pneumonia once many years ago. Chronic productive cough with occasional blood streaking, exertional dyspnea, and weight loss. Chest exam, only a transient expiratory bronchus, give a cough, it clears. Chest x-ray is red as showing lingular pneumonia. But chest CT scan is obtained because this is a chronic process and she has bronchiectasis with a tree and bud nodularity in the right middle lobe, in the lingula, a little bit in the right lower lobe. And the radiologist said this raises the possibility of non-tuberculous mycobacterial uh, infection, or they might even consider aspiration due to the tree and bud nodularity. Maybe here's an example, interesting uh, CAT scan image with some bronchiexis, peripheral, mild, minor dilation of the bronchi, bronchiectasis here, another bronchus dilated here, and then the tree and bud nodules. Can you make out these little dots? Little dots surrounding, uh, here's uh, an example where the vessels make up the tree and the dots are the buds along this tree. Small nodules, here again, multiple small nodules, mild bronchiectasis, um, could be non-tuberculous mycobacterial infection. Based on these findings, what should we do? Two-week course of uh, levofloxacin, initiate therapy for M. avium intracellularity with azithromycin, ethambutol, and rifampin. Initiate therapy for non-tuberculous mycobacterium with INH, ethambutol, rifampin, and pyrazinamide. Sputum for AFB culture and smear, or blood for uh, ANCA, thinking possible pulmonary vasculitis. It's quite a diverse series of possibilities. What do you think? I think this is a pretty classic presentation for non-tuberculous mycobacterial pulmonary infection, Lady Windermere's syndrome, or postmenopausal woman, possibly thin, weight loss, productive cough, intermittent hemoptysis, um, could be the radiographic uh, appearance, as the radiologist said, would be quite classic. What to do about it, we need to establish the diagnosis. It's not enough suspicion based on imaging and history. We need to obtain uh, 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 AFB positive culture, mycobacterial culture, and identify of the non-tuberculous mycobacterium, which one is it? Is it MAI, the most common, as was raised as a possibility here? Or is it M. abscessus or other mycobacterium that would require different therapy? Levofloxacin might be good for acute flare of bronchiectasis, but won't address this issue of a year-long or more illness. Treatment for MAI may come if she grows MAI in her sputum and the answer B is an appropriate regimen, but we don't know. We have a suspicion we need to confirm it. Typically, the dogma is two positive sputum cultures for mycobacterium or one bronchoscopic culture, then we can initiate therapy because we're certain of the etiology. The INH, ethambutol, rifampin, and pyrazinamide uh, regimen in answer C is for uh, tuberculosis, as you know, a four-drug regimen for tuberculosis, not for the non-tuberculous mycobacterium. And this isn't the picture of an ANCA-related vascular, pulmonary vasculitis. Okay, we have a, a blood gas um, uh, exercise, if you would, 
It says an arterial blood gas with a PO2 of 40 and a PCO2 of 80 and a pH of 7.1 in a patient breathing room air. We're going to try and match it with one of the following histories, hypoxemia, hypercapnia, acidosis. And these lab values, are they associated with which of the following? ARDS, most likely. What's the best fit? ARDS, a severe asthmatic attack, severe bacterial pneumonia, end-stage uh, COPD, or sedative drug overdose. And uh, this is a game, you know, it's, uh, in real life, you have a patient and a history and exam and x-rays, et cetera. We're just playing the game to think about uh, blood gas analysis. Um, and I think it also allows me just to remind you of what I think are two very useful sets of equations in thinking about uh, blood gas analysis and respiratory disorders. And the first has to do with the question of uh, respiratory acidosis, right? PCO2, 80, pH 7.1, this is going to be a respiratory acidosis. And in thinking about which etiology fits best, I think we want to decide, is this an acute respiratory acidosis or a chronic respiratory acidosis? chronic as might be seen in COPD or acute on chronic. Uh, uh, and uh, the, the formula that I uh, try and remember is that the change in pH that we would expect, the fall in pH for an acute respiratory acidosis uh, is uh, the increase in PCO2 in millimeters mercury times 0.008, or I tend to think about it as if the PCO2 goes up 10 millimeters from 40 to 50, then we'd expect the pH to go down by 0 0.08. For chronic, when there's renal compensation, then there's a much smaller change in pH buffered by bicarbonate. And so the, PCO, the, the pH goes down only 0 0.003 units for every increase in PCO2 above 40 and acute on chronic is somewhere in between. So our patient at a PCO2 of 80, which meant that the delta, you know, how much above 40 was the PCO2? It was 40. So the change in pH was 40. If it were an acute uh, respiratory acidosis, it would be 40 times 0 0.008. And the pH, we would have thought about 7.08. If it were chronic, it would be closer to 7.28 and acute on chronic somewhere in between. And our patient clearly has an acute respiratory acidosis. The pH of 7.1 was closest to an acute change. And so this isn't a, a chronic process like a COPD. It's an acute process. Bacterial pneumonia, I think that's not commonly associated, and ARDS, not so commonly associated with hypercapnia. But... Um, sedative drug overdose, that could be an acute respiratory uh, acidosis or a severe asthma attack, that would, could be a, acute as well. So we have, I, in my mind, a couple of good options left. How do we choose among those? And the second equation is the uh, uh, measurement of the uh, alveolar to arterial gradient for oxygen, the AADO2, as it said, AA gradient for oxygen which is the difference between the alveolar and the arterial PO2. And this is useful because it helps distinguish the presence of some ventilation perfusion imbalance, VQ mismatching, which widens the AA gradient as would a shunt versus uh, hypoxemia strictly due to hypoventilation, the rise in PCO2 without maldistribution of ventilation perfusion, in which case the AA gradient should be preserved relatively normal. So we can do a quick AA gradient calculation. It's the, uh, we measure arterial PO2, we estimate the alveolar PO2 as the barometric pressure minus 47 times the inspired oxygen concentration. Here at room air, it's gonna be 0.21 minus PCO2 over R, and we're going to assume the respiratory quotient is 0 
So this simplifies at sea level where the barometric pressure should be 760 or so, and that it simplifies to 150 minus the PCO2 divided by 0.08. So for our patient, we're gonna calculate the alveolar PO2 using a PCO2 in this equation of 80 and estimate the alveolar PO2 would be about 50. The measured arterial PO2 was 40, and so the calculated AA gradient for oxygen is 10. That's very narrow. That's within the normal range. There isn't widespread VQ mismatching in this patient. Doesn't fit with uh, status asthmaticus, which would certainly impair the matching of ventilation through widely uh, narrowed airways. And so most likely diagnosis here is sedative drug overdose, hypercapnia due to uh, central uh, depression of respiratory drive. The PCO2 went up to 80 and acutely the PO2 uh, went down to 40 and there was no widening of the AA gradient. And uh, I think many of you came to this conclusion without doing the calculations, but it is fun to go through. Okay, here's a quick uh, one. A 52-year-old school teacher presenting for a checkup. Recently moved to this area to assume a new teaching position. Never smoked cigarettes. Found to be healthy previously. Physical exam, lab data are normal. She has a chest x-ray. Not quite sure why, but she has a chest x-ray that finds this uh, fairly large, one by 1.8 centimeter. It's smooth, well demarcated nodule in the right middle lobe. Asymptomatic incidental discovery of a lung nodule. What should we do? A PET CT scan, transthoracic needle biopsy, ask the pulmonologist to perform bronchoscopy, maybe navigational bronchoscopy to localize the lesion obtain prior chest x-rays from the former physician, order chest MRI. And perhaps we should ask what's most cost effective. And let's agree that the workup of a solitary pulmonary nodule should begin by review of prior films. That's the point of this question. It's a good place to start. And it may take a lot of effort to find these old films. And uh, maybe it was an x-ray of a shoulder or abdomen, and we're just catching part of the lung tissue. But let's look to see if this nodule was there before. Maybe she didn't know about it. Maybe it wasn't commented on. I don't know. But comparison of prior images. Because remember, if the nodule has not changed in size for two years, in a, a uniformly solid nodule, you can be sure this is a benign lesion. Maybe it's a hematoma, maybe it's a histoplasmoma. Uh, and lack of change in size over two years assures its benign nature and so saves all this other extensive workup uh, uh, in terms of etiology. Here's a case history, a 47-year-old woman with a six-week history of non-productive cough, moderate exertional dyspnea, and fever, persistent low-grade fevers. Patient has been in good health in the past, although she smoked two packs of cigarettes for the last 25 years. She has, uh, was given over this period of time a course of clarithromycin and then another course, uh, but had no improvement. No family history of ocular disease, skin rash, arthritis. You're thinking about some systemic inflammatory disease. Physical exam shows normal jugular venous pressure, no peripheral lymph adenopathy. The intensity of breath sounds normal, except over the lower lung zones. They're reduced. They're bilateral basilar crackles. No bronchial breathing or agophony. No wheezing. Laboratory study, she's uh, a bit anemic, low-grade uh, leukocytosis, 5% um, eosinophil is not particularly high, normal renal function, normal urinalysis, and the chest x-ray is said to show airspace disease in both lung bases. Here's perhaps what it might look like. Would you call this consolidation? I think maybe you could see an air bronchogram. 
alveolar space is full, uh, airway is still patent with air. Um, by Basler, subacute illness, why we didn't hear bronchial breath sounds, I can't tell you, one might have. What do you think the most likely diagnosis is? Is this Legionnaire's disease, Wegener's granulomatosis, streptococcus pneumonia, pneumonia, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, what was previously referred to as bronchiolitis obliterans organizing pneumonia, sometimes still is. People use the term boop because it sounds funny. I'm leaning towards cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. I hope you are too. Legionnaires, the others aren't great fits. Legionnaires disease should have been treated with uh, um, the clarithromycin. There really wasn't any evidence for a systemic vasculitis, renal function, urinalysis normal. Streptococcus pneumonia, I doesn't fit over this uh, subacute period of several weeks and two courses of clarithromycin. And as you well know now, idiopathic, this is not the radiographic appearance of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, the interstitial pattern with honeycomb. So I think this is most likely cryptogenic organized pneumonia, and that might fit persistent infiltrates or opacities, uh, low grade fever, cough, without much uh, sputum production, no positive cultures, refractory to um, antibiotics. And the treatment is going to be systemic corticosteroids. As some would do bronchoscopy and biopsy to be sure the diagnosis, others would say, look, I, we're going to give an empiric course of oral steroids first. And I just wanted to take a minute to remind you uh, this Boop, bronchiolitis obliterans organizing pneumonia, which we're calling cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, is different than bronchiolitis obliterans or a constrictive bronchiolitis, which we've touched upon in a different lecture. This uh, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia is pneumonia like. Uh, bronchiolitis obliterans is an obstructive disease, emphysema like. The X-ray in BOOP is uh, multifocal, diffuse opacities might migrate in different areas like our patient. In uh, a bronchiolitis obliterans, it's hyperinflation. Uh, one is a restrictive disease, the other is an obstructive disease. Uh, this cryptogenic organizing pneumonia that our patient now has should respond very well to systemic steroids. She'll feel better, the infiltrates will clear. There's uh, constrictive bronchiolitis, the obstructive, lung disease is poorly responsive to steroids. We have a series of uh, uh, questions that we can go through in the format of uh, 10 through 14 is a statement and does it apply to emphysema, asthma, both emphysema and asthma or neither? So let's go through these. A majority of cigarette smokers are affected Emphysema, asthma, both, neither, neither really, uh, certainly not asthma, but uh, even uh, emphysema, it turns out it's a minority of long-term cigarette smokers who go on to develop COPD and emphysema, some significant susceptibility, but it's not uniform, so neither would fit with a majority which uh, uh, has a reduced FEV1 to FEC ratio on pulmonary function testing. Remember this one? FEV1 divided by FEC is really a marker of airflow obstruction. If it's reduced, there's airflow obstruction. Both are associated with airflow obstruction. Both uh, asthma and emphysema might have a reduced FEV1 to FEC ratio. Which one is associated with the reduced diffusion capacity, the ability to transfer gas across the alveolar capillary membrane? Which of these destroys alveolar capillary membrane? Emphysema, right. Asthma should have a normal, it's an airway disease, should have a normal diffusion capacity. Most patients have a deficiency of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. That's a giveaway, right? Neither. Uh, I don't know, a small percentage of patients with emphysema will have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. 
and Montelukast, the leukotriene receptor antagonist, should be useful in which in which of these disorders do leukotrienes play a role? And I wanted to highlight that it's asthma, even though a lot of patients with COPD are prescribed Montelukast, there's probably no role other than if they have um, seasonal rhinitis, you know, allergic rhinitis. But for lung disease, Montelukast addresses leukotriene overproduction and therefore is only applicable to asthma. Same format, four more questions, and our answers are adult respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, low pressure pulmonary edema, or severe cardiogenic pulmonary edema, both or neither. Characterized by severe and diffuse uh, lung infiltrates. That's easy, right? That would be both, would have widespread edema most commonly caused by sepsis and gastric aspiration. I think you're all over these, right? That's uh, ARDS, certainly not heart failure. Positive pressure ventilation may be an important adjunct treatment. That, I guess, could be uh, a BiPAP ventilation, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, or intubation and positive pressure ventilation, and there has a role in both. Uh, and uh, certainly a positive end expiratory pressure as well, PEEP. And then corticosteroids uh, have been shown to be beneficial if initiated early. There's so much controversy, but I would say neither. Certainly not heart failure, and there's no good evidence that early initiation of steroid therapy helps treat ARDS. All right, another mix and match. And this is uh, sort of, do you know these facts? Uh, we're gonna try and associate the uh, four items highlighted in yellow with either rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, lymphangiolyomyomatosis, or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. All right, those are our potential answers. For necrobiotic nodules, the pathology, do you know this one? It's rheumatoid arthritis, uh, just like the subcutaneous uh, nodules that patients with the rheumatoid arthritis might develop. Nodules in the lung would be these necrobiotic nodules. Which of these only occurs in women? Not many diseases we can say this, but it is, remember, Lymphangiolyomyomatosis, or LAM, develops almost exclusively in women, uh, particularly in childbearing uh, age. Diabetes insipidus, that's one of these facts. Do you know the association with which of these uh, posterior pituitary involvement in Langerhans cell histiocytosis? And last, the susceptibility to recurrent aspiration pneumonias due to esophageal dysfunction and an advanced disease, even oral pharyngeal dysfunction and aspiration occurs in scleroderma. Right. All right, that leaves one last theme that we wanted to touch upon, and that is latent pulmonary tuberculosis. We're gonna have a number of cases and you can decide whether to treat them uh, uh, for their latent pulmonary TB. So just to review, right, mycobacterium tuberculosis, the tuberculosis germs can be dormant, resident in the lungs without any evidence for active infection. They are alive in the lungs, but not causing disease and that's latent a tuberculous infection or LT, LTBI. And the reason it's important, as you know, is because most cases uh, of active TB, most people who develop active pulmonary tuberculosis did so on the basis of reactivation of their latent uh, TB. So we have the opportunity to prevent the development of active TB by treating these mycobacterium germs at a time when they are asymptomatic or latent infection. However, these are patients who are asymptomatic and may have a rather small uh, a risk of actively going on to develop 
active TB. The drugs can have potential serious side effects. And so is it appropriate to treat an asymptomatic person with a potentially toxic drug? Uh, or can we weigh the risks and benefits of treatment or not? That's really the issue. And this has been thought about by a lot of people. And the recommendations that I think are pretty clear are treat latent tuberculous infection. In those who have evidence either of relatively recent development of this latent tuberculosis, because that's the period in which uh, latent disease can go on to uh, reactivation in the first couple of years after you've acquired the germ. So recent acquisition, because you acquired it from a household contact who had active TB, or because we knew that you had a negative TB test and now you have a positive TB test that's changed within the last couple of years, you've recently acquired the organism, or because you've immigrated to this country from an area where there's endemic infection and we don't know when you acquire the infection. It could be relatively recent if you have a positive PPD. Those patients should be treated with, uh, uh, for their latent disease. That's the major group of recent infection. The other group is those who have immunocompromising uh, disorders, comorbidities that make it possible for these germs to reactivate. Severe poorly controlled diabetes is interesting. HIV, dialysis, starting treatment with high dose steroids and uh, immunosuppressive drugs for your malignancy, profound weight loss and silicosis. Those are some of the entities that impair your ability to fight off germ and predisposed to uh, active disease. So it would be appropriate to treat latent TB in these conditions. And then in parentheses, because it's debated, is anyone under age 35. The benefit is lifelong protection against ever reactivating disease. The, the argument against it is uh, uh, it's not clearly evident that the risk benefit, uh, you know, depending on the modeling, it is not clearly evident that treatment is uh, of value. And so um, uh, guidelines have left it sort of uh, to personal, dis individual discretion, as they say. Now, what's a positive PPD? If you're at high risk, it's uh, anything greater than five millimeters. You're trying to weigh the likelihood that this skin reaction to the uh, PPD uh, antigen is uh, not due to um, some other mycobacterium, but it's really due to TB. And any uh, small reaction, you're going to say that's good enough. In moderate risk population, the standard was greater than 10 millimeters of induration. Remember, not the redness, but the raised up indurated portion of the reaction. And in a low risk population, a healthy healthcare worker who had to have screening positive PPD, you'd say more than 15 millimeters of induration. Otherwise, you're going to have a lot of false positives in these healthy people. And so, what's high risk, what's low risk? Just to reiterate, high risk patient, five millimeters or greater HIV, immunosuppression, recent household contact, or we didn't highlight, I should have, as patients, it's fewer and fewer who have like that fibrocalcific upper zone disease that we looked at earlier, who have extensive scarring on their x-ray, consistent with inactive disease, maybe a cavity, and for some reason never received anti-tuberculous treatment. They had um, were in a sanatorium. They, it was before effective therapy. Uh, they had other uh, treatments, uh, but not uh, uh, drug therapy. Fewer and fewer patients now, but that group would have a high burden of mycobacterium and should be treated. And a high risk, five millimeters. Moderate risk are those with increased risk of exposure for residents in nursing homes, healthcare workers, et cetera. Uh, also, those with increased risk of activation because of these comorbidities, including, and this is worth remembering in the modern era. Those who are about to be treated with tumor necrosis factor alpha, right, TNF uh, inhibitors, they should be screened for latent tuberculosis because a positive PPD uh, and someone then about to get uh, TNF alpha blocker, they should be treated, and that would be a 10 millimeter uh, 
positive PPD. And then what about, it's often asked uh, persons with a positive um, skin test who had received a BCG vaccine uh, uh, as a child or young adult, um, and uh, now they have a positive PPD. Is it from the BCG? Is it from latent tuberculous infection? The recommendations have been traditionally, if it's positive, forget about BCG, assume it's due to mycobacterium, but we can do better now with the help of these blood tests, the interferon gamma releasing assays uh, like uh, T-spot TB and interferon gold, in which you uh, uh, can identify patients with about the same sensitivity and specificity as um, TB uh, skin testing, but BCG doesn't cause a positive IGRA result. So a positive result, you can be sure that's due to latent tuberculosis. A BCG does not falsely cause positive interferon gamma releasing as, uh, assay results. And, and the other advantage of the blood test, I think we're using them more and more rather than skin testing. One, you don't have to come back two days later to read the results uh, from a skin test. And two, there's less likely to be cross-reactivity with other uh, uh, be non-tuberculous, atypical mycobacterium. All right, with that introduction, let's uh, address these, that's our final questions. Would you treat this patient uh, uh, with, uh, for example, six to nine months of isoniazid? This is a 21-year-old healthcare worker who comes to see you with a TB skin test reaction of 15 millimeters of induration. The um, chest X-ray is obtained and it's normal. The skin test was positive five years ago, about 10 millimeters. 21-year-old healthcare worker, positive PPD, strongly positive PPD, chest X-ray normal. Personally, I would. I think there's room for controversy, uh, but age 21, Life ahead, um, he's going to wonder, especially when he has small children at home and has a cough and lingering fever, could this be reactivation of my TB? The chance of toxicity from INH is age-related. It's very, very low at age 21, increases with age. So low risk of uh, drug toxicity, lifelong protection against um, this becoming activated TB, I probably would treat a young person under age 35. Here's one that we're going to debate, I'm afraid. A 74-year-old man, no known TB exposure, has a test of five millimeters in duration, discovered on routine testing a positive PPD at five millimeters, and then they repeated it uh, uh, one week later, and now it's 15 millimeters of in duration. So with that, a chest X-ray was obtained and it is normal. Should this person be treated? And I'd like to argue no. I'd like to argue that this is a 74-year-old man with a positive PPD skin test and a normal X-ray asymptomatic without identified risk factors, either recent uh, exposure or immunocompromise or abnormal uh, x-ray with old scarring that never got treated. And therefore, uh, the risk of treatment exceed benefit. And I just wanted to go over what happened here when his skin test was five millimeters and repeated one week later and it was 15 millimeters. That's not a recent converter, right? I mean, this isn't someone who got TB in the last week between tests. This is called the booster phenomenon. It's a person previously exposed to TB, so they do have latent tuberculosis, but on initial testing had a negative five millimeter result, and then we repeated it and it became positive. And the initial result was really a false negative. At age 74, his immunity, cellular immunity had waned, and uh, there, there was not a good response to the protein put under the skin with a skin test. But then 
one week later, after the uh, T cells were uh, stimulated with just that little bit of protein under the skin, there was a boosting of the immune response. Now an appropriate reaction. He had had uh, latent tuberculosis. One week later now, after the booster phenomenon, he has a po clearly positive PPT skin test on re-exposure to the tuberculin protein. Uh, so the booster phenomenon is distinguished from recent conversion. It's used in uh, nursing homes and hospitals, this two-step procedure, looking for false negatives on the initial testing in older population. So that's how we, by doing the repeat testing, we found he had a positive PPD, but there was no indication to treat his PPD. We're going to get a chest X-ray, make sure he's not sick. All right, three to go. A 45-year-old former IV drug abuser, HIV positive, x-ray is clear, TB test is only five millimeters in induration. He doesn't remember about prior tests. Equivocal. Should we treat him for latent tuberculosis? Yes. IV drug abuser, HIV positive, We'll consider five millimeters of induration in this high-risk patient positive and his risk for going on to active disease high. Let's treat. 53-year-old woman, no known medical illnesses, clear chest x-ray, eight millimeters in duration. She has never had skin testing, now tested because her husband has just had active TB diagnosed after his six-month illness. Should she be treated for latent tuberculosis? I hope this is 100%. We all agree, yes. Household contact, uh, eight millimeters is sufficient to say this is a positive PPD skin test. She's at greatest risk in this period of recent acquisition, presumably from her husband of the mycobacterium organisms, and should be treated. And last one. 26-year-old homeless man, TB skin test of 15 millimeters in duration, and no symptoms. He goes, gets a chest x-ray to evaluate this, has a left upper lobe infiltrate. Would you treat him with uh, uh, isoniazid uh, for his latent tuberculous infection? His chest x-ray shows a left upper lobe infiltrate. Did I mention that? So let's not treat what could be active pulmonary tuberculosis with a single drug, isoniazid, thinking that we're treating just the positive PPD. Even though he's asymptomatic, this up, upper lobe, right, upper lobe opacity could well be active tuberculosis. We'll need to investigate it sputum, induced sputum, bronchoscopy, just to be sure that this is an active TB. But let's not treat with a single drug, otherwise we'll uh, foster the uh, emergence of resistant strains and then he'll be in deep trouble if this does prove to be active tuberculosis. So only when we're sure that it's not active TB can we uh, consider treatment with single drug profiles. And the treatment is typically nine months, that's the standard. Uh, six months is probably uh, sufficient, uh, and if you complete six months of daily therapy, it's likely that you've uh, cleared the infection. Rifampin uh, uh, for four months is very appealing, it's well tolerated, and um, has no higher incidence of uh, toxicity than the INH. And now this new regimen, you may have seen isoniazid plus rifapentin, it's given a total of 12 doses, once a week for three months. That's pretty uh, tolerable uh, and uh, a, a sort of a short course for um, latent tuberculous infection. In general, patients don't have to have routine screening blood tests unless you have HIV infection, pregnancy, or liver disease, or risk of liver disease with alcohol use. We can just ask patients to report on their isoniazid or other uh, treatment, are you having nausea, vomiting, or other clues in the absence of that routine blood testing is not recommended. And that's all I have to share today. Thank you very much for this chance to review topics in pulmonary medicine.